Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sim Kapoor, and I am the Director of Advancement Communications and External Relations at OISE. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our Alumni and Friends Leadership Series with Dr. Hilary Inwood of the Sustainability and Climate Action Network. Dr. Inwood is also a, te uh, a teacher for the Master of Teaching program at OISE. Uh, I admire Dr. Inwood for her passion uh, and her tremendous research. Uh, today, she'll be talking about shifting climate anxiety to climate action. Before we begin today's uh, sustainability and climate presentation, uh, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're very grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Thank you to the nearly 300 OIV and UFT alumni, faculty, students, and friends for joining us today. And over to uh, Natalie Newman Butler. Uh, and thank you to Brian and Natalie for organizing this wonderful uh, workshop for us today. And a huge thank you to our distinguished guests. Uh, and Natalie will announce and introduce uh, Elise. Go ahead, Natalie. Thank you so much, Sim. I uh, don't have much more to add. We have nearly 300 people registered for this event, U of T alumni, faculty, students, staff, and friends. I'm gonna pass it right to Elise Kennedy. Uh, she is a uh, doctoral student at OISE um, and member of the Sustainability and Climate Act, uh, Action Network. And she'll introduce uh, Dr. Inwood for us. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Elias Kennedy. Um, I'm a proud OISE alumni and together with my fellow alum, Asasani, we are really excited to have everyone here today to engage in this talk, especially for alumni. Um, Asa and I connected through the OISE Alumni Association because of our passion for environmental sustainability. And when we were talking, we thought it'd be really great to have an event like this that we can get other alumni in the community together to talk about this really important topic, as well as highlight what's happening at, at OISE which is why we were really excited to have our great speaker here tonight, Dr. Hilary Inwood. So Hilary is a teacher educator, a researcher, and an artist who leads the Sustainability and Climate Action Network at OISE. Her research focuses on deepening teachers' knowledge and skills in environmental learning and developing creative approaches to climate action. She coordinates a multi-year collaboration with the TDSB's Eco Schools program, as well as co-chairs a national Canadian network that aims to better embed sustainability and climate action into teacher education all over Canada. Her work extends beyond classrooms to include school gardens, outdoor education centers, parks, and galleries. I've been really lucky to have Hillary as an inspiration and friend throughout my time at OISE. And I'm so happy that she's joining us today. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Hillary. Thank you so much, Elise. It's actually really meaningful to me to have you introduce me today. Thank you. And thank you, Sim, for those kind words to begin. Thanks to Natalie and to Brian and as to all the whole team for uh, the OISE Alumni Association for helping to organize this. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And Elise and I have worked very closely together um, over the last uh, five or six years on this work. So to have her introduce me is, is particularly meaningful. So thank you very much. Um, we're starting actually in OISE's lobby, believe it or not. The photograph that you're seeing on the screen right now is the, the new installation. I know many of you will not have seen it yet because of course the building has been for the most part closed during the first couple of years of the pandemic. So uh, very excited to introduce you to the new living wall that we have in Boise's lobby. And I'm hoping this is sort of a, a great kickoff uh, for our, our talk about how we are better embedding sustainability and climate action, certainly into the work that we do at OISE, but uh, really across the education system as well. Now, today's um, webinar was in fact billed as a workshop. Uh, didn't know that we were gonna have a couple hundred people sign up for it. <laughs> and that makes the interaction part a little trickier, but I am gonna encourage you to grab a piece of paper um, and or a digital document, something that you can make notes on, make drawings on um, uh, along the way to help record some of your responses. And we're gonna encourage you to get involved by giving the responses in the chat. Know that in the chat, you have a choice of either sending a comment just to uh, myself as a host and um, the panelists, uh, but you're also welcome to uh, send it to everybody. So there's a little drop down menu and you can choose your response. And I'm hoping we can use the chat today as a way of communicating with each, with each other uh, throughout this webinar. So with that in mind, um, one thing I am not going to do today is try to convince you that there is a climate crisis. I think we're, you know, 
All, all the world scientists are kind of on the same page on that <laughs> at this point in time. Um, the UN director last summer described the climate crisis as a code red for humanity. I'm not sure it gets much stronger in terms of wording than that. Um, and you know, the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which is the group of thousands of environmental scientists around the world, um, have been very clear that the climate crisis is real, uh, that it does uh, is being caused by human impact on the earth. And uh, their most recent part of their reports, in fact, it was just, re um, just released uh, a couple of days ago. And it's saying that um, we are at the very sort of top of the worst of the expectations that have been predicted for climate change and that climate change is actually happening at a greater pace than was originally anticipated as well. So, you know, we have significant issues to deal with, with the climate crisis. We know it's a result of rampant capitalism, of hyper-consumerism and globalization. If you need to read a little bit more up on that, just read anything written by Naomi Klein, <laughs> who's a wonderful Canadian and fantastic uh, uh, author who has written extensively on these topics. Um, there's a growing recognition that, of course, um, because of the climate crisis, that it is just compounding oppression and other forms of injustices uh, that are already existing for marginalized and racialized people around the world. So those uh, injustices can be racial in origin, they can be economic injustices or geographic in origin. Um, they are certainly hitting different generations in different ways, and we'll talk about that today. And uh, we know that it's also having an effect between species. So even though it's caused by humans, other species are kind of taking the load of the impact in many ways. So um, uh, I will point out that I'm going to provide a resource list for you at the end of today's talk. And in fact, I have cited um, Jennifer. I've cited Naomi Klein's uh, one of her books uh, on that. This changes everything. And uh, that'll help you find uh, that book moving forward and a number of the other research studies and, and other references that I'm making uh, throughout this talk. So, you know, climate change is just one of many very pressing issues. We've been kind of focused on the tsunami that has been the pandemic um, in uh, recent years. And I, I thank my colleague, uh, Karen Acton, who's a faculty member in LHAE at OISE for sharing this cartoon at a workshop I attended with her just recently. Uh, it's a wonderful cartoon and uh, very poignant in pointing out that we've got a whole bunch of tsunamis coming up that we need to worry about. Um, we know growing inflation is happening in this country and perhaps a recession that may go along with that. Um, we can add the war in Ukraine as another tsunami that is causing all sorts of anxiety, I think, for many of us, uh, especially those who live in Ukraine and Eastern Europe. Um, but, but the whole time climate change is absolutely um, coming, coming down the pipe. And, and Pat, I would recognize, thanks for your question about the role of population growth. You're absolutely right that population growth is one of the factors um, that's contributing to a greater impact uh, in the climate crisis. Um, so there's, there's many different facets to it, and we need to get a, a grip on all of them if we're going to continue to exist um, in a sustainable way on this earth. So, you know, I'm interested in how you're feeling about the climate crisis. So we've got just a little poll we're gonna uh, launch. I'm hoping that one of the team can do that now, please. And we're, I'm interested in, in where you're at. Are you kind of in the terrified stage at this point? Are you waking up at night dreading the impacts of uh, the climate crisis? Are you more at the worried stage? I know it's kind of coming, but other issues are maybe more pressing. And uh, are, are you actually one of the optimists who are saying, well, this is actually maybe a way that we can work towards a more just recovery from the pandemic, one that offers uh, really wonderful opportunities to, to actually improve some of the complex and wicked problems that we're facing as a human species. So I think the poll is now being launched. So if I can ask you to complete that, and you're only allowed a single choice, unfortunately, maybe I should have made that so you could have more than one choice, because I, I think I actually um, I feel uh, about the the climate crisis, uh, all of these different aspects, <laughs> uh, depending on which day of the week it is and which report has been just been launched by the IPCC, for sure. So I'm not able to see the, uh, I can see the poll up. I just can't see the, uh, the results for it. So I'll have to have one member of the team maybe share that with me. Oh, and there it's just come in there. We've closed the poll. So we've got about, and this is a, roughly what I expected, um, you know, uh, about 25% of you are waking up terrified at night thinking about the climate crisis. Um, another 25 roughly percent are on the hopeful side and we've got about 45 or 50% in the middle in that sort of worried status. So um, I think that's probably pretty accurate about how 
um, certainly populations in North America anyway, are feeling about it uh, these days. Now, let's get a little more specific though. In the chat, can I ask you, and if you can address this to everyone, that would be fantastic. Um, could you please pop in just a word or two? We don't need any long sentences because with so many people in the room, we're gonna have a hard time reading them all, but just a word or two about how you're feeling about the climate crisis. How would you describe your feelings? So from Allison, I'm seeing overwhelmed, very sad from Helen, deeply concerned from Nicole, fearful from Shelley, uh, anxious, avoidant, frustrated, mourning from Catherine. Thank you, Catherine, yep. Uh, in too deep, stressed, powerless. Uh, and uh, and uh, Michaela has said anxious. And I think you're, you're absolutely right about that, Michaela. I think lots of us are sharing that. Um, thank you so much for sharing those words, but I'm not seeing a lot of happy emotions there. I've seen a lot of concern um, and uh, really deep concern about how we're going to move forward um, in, the, in the climate crisis. Now, we know that there's a lot of anxiety around this. And I think your comments in the chat continue as they continue to flood in. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, continue to show um, what uh, The Lancet is, which is one of the leading medical journals in the Western world, found already in 2009 that climate change is in fact one of the biggest threats to global health and especially to mental health in the 21st century. We've got a whole new set of words that are being used to describe in fact climate anxiety. There's the word eco-anxiety, I think used often interchangeably with climate anxiety to talk about the chronic fear of environmental doom. And there's been a whole flood of movies, well, maybe pun intended, uh, a whole flood of movies recently that have been talking about the climate crisis. And I think this really um, makes it feel a little bit more real for people who perhaps aren't quite yet experiencing the effects that some are around the world. We also know that lots of people around the world are already experiencing ecological grief, another one of these new terms that uh, has just come into play in recent years. And um, I'm thinking about um, some of our fellow Canadians in British Columbia who are watching uh, and have watched their homeland, the forests burn around them in recent years and floods quite literally have submerged their homes this last summer. Um, and in a similar term, the word solstagia is another one that it describes the homesickness that you can experience when your home becomes unrecognizable. Um, and, and that's one that's being experienced in different communities around the world. And I think particularly for those who are experiencing ocean rise, uh, water level rise um, more rapidly than others as they've literally seen the gain their homes disappearing with no promise of, of coming back. So we know that climate anxiety is requiring a whole new language to describe what we're feeling um, and, and how we're gonna start to deal with um, those, those feelings. I would say that climate anxiety, I think in many regards is actually being um, uh, experienced at different types of rates uh, by different people around the world. And we know that uh, race is a significant predictor in terms of experiences of the climate crisis and of pollution in particular. Um, these figures are from the states to be fair, um, from the nation. Uh, we are, are not currently collecting uh, data on environmental racism in Canada and how different proportions, especially racialized and marginalized people, are experiencing the climate crisis um, in a disproportionate ways. Uh, whether they are communities that live in uh, closer to toxic waste, some are experiencing um, uh, a greater level of, of pollution and uh, all the toxicities that come with that whether um, they are experiencing um, more toxins in the air, the number that's being quoted from the states is a 38% higher um, access uh, or exposure to uh, nitrogen dioxide. Or, and we know this one to be true in Canada, um, that uh, people who are black, who are of color and uh, indigenous communities are more likely to be living without uh, clean water. And that's certainly true in here in Canada when it comes to indigenous communities. Uh, this is a, a well-known um, stat in Canada. We also know that the impacts on youth are quite significant as well. And so uh, Greta Thunberg was really one of the first youths. Uh, she's from Sweden. If you haven't heard her talk, wow, you need to do a deep dive uh, on YouTube into all of the incredible advocacy she's done around the climate crisis uh, through the different um, COP meetings that the UN has organized. Um, starting in COP24, she has made a, a plea to adults around the world to stop um, paying lip service to the climate crisis and to actually do something. She has recognized her, um, her anxiety or climate anxiety as part of this and has been really instrumental in um, getting youth around the world 
to become advocates for, uh, for really dealing with and addressing climate change in significant ways, not in the minor ways that we've been doing in the past. Um, we have similar youth advocates uh, here in Canada. If you're not familiar with Autumn Peltier's work as uh, the water ambassador for her First Nation community, she's from Wikwemekong on Manitoulin Island. Uh, she has done some impressive talks both here in Canada as well as internationally, um, really uh, very clearly stating the challenges around water and um, the effects on indigenous communities around the world. And she is not alone in this. Another study, a, a recent one in The Lancet from Marx et al. Uh, in, in fact, surveyed 10,000 youth from around the world. 81% of those youth felt dismissed or ignored when talking with others about climate change. So what we are telling them um, is that this, this is not important. And, and they know it is. Um, they've been very, very clear that this is about their lives and livelihoods moving forward. And that as adults, we need to not only be part of the conversation, but part of the action moving forward to help them address climate anxiety. We know that many teachers in schools are registering this with their students. They're hearing their students vocalize their climate anxiety really clearly. So we need to be, again, uh, working with youth to listen carefully to them, to what their needs are, as well as really um, uh, working with them in terms of climate solutions. So let's do a little test here. There is something called the Hog Eco Anxiety Scale, in fact, that allows, you know, it's got 15 different um, items in it, to be fair, in this, in this scale. We're not going to do all 15 here. We're just going to do four. But this is one way that you can start to get a little sense of whether you are suffering yourself from climate anxiety. So let's take a little book here. Uh, I'll take a little look. Um, uh, are you feeling afraid about climate change? I'm going to guess that many of us are. Um, uh, at least I'm going to put you on the spot here just for a second. You are um, uh, certainly more youthful than I am. Um, <laughs> would you say that the people that you talk to of your age group um, are feeling afraid of climate change these days? Yeah, for sure. Actually, I had a conversation with a friend saying it's always the conversation that comes up at the end of the night after a few drinks. It's on everyone's mind, but no one wants to talk about it. Oh, isn't that interesting? Okay, good. And then maybe that's after having a few libations. Maybe that's when yeah, exactly. that's the purpose <laughs> that you wouldn't necessarily uh, raise uh, right off the bat. Okay. So do you have difficulty in working, sleeping, or enjoying social situations when thinking about climate change? And I know that I do because I've got a, quite a large extended family. Um, I'm blessed that way. Um, and I know that we have gotten into a couple of huge debates about climate change uh, and about how different members of our family are addressing it these days or not addressing it uh, as well. <laughs> okay, are you feeling anxious about your responsibility or impact on climate change? And Asta, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you on the spot now and, and ask where you are on this situation. Do you have any um, feelings of anxiety around climate change? Definitely. I think um, where it stems from is, you know, us knowing that every decision we make has an impact, but then knowing how to make a better decision and being equipped with a toolkit that you can always lean on. So I think that's that's the gap. And, and I obviously love that we're starting with kids and teachers are paying attention. But at least when, when I was growing up, this was not um, a crisis or at least identified as a crisis and we weren't given um, the appropriate tools. So it feels like you're always left to your own devices to, to find out what to do. Yeah. And I love that you're one of our OISE alumni. They're actually taking a really active role in thinking about how we can embed sustainability in the work that we do, um, which is fabulous. And I guess this is one of the, the bigger factors. Can Are you at a point where you can't stop worrying about uh, the climate crisis? And um, I know that it's on my, my you know, top of mind very, very often. And um, and figuring out ways to move forward with our anxieties, if, if any of these describe you, and you're welcome. Again, I've put the, the hog eco anxiety scale, in fact, on the resource list. So you can try out the whole, uh, the whole test if you want. Uh, moving forward, you could even try it out with your students if you're an educator. So I'm interested if, if you do suffer from climate anxiety, how you are attempting to reduce it. So could you pop into the chat, please, some of your ideas about how you're reducing climate anxiety? So Jen McTaggart, thank you, says by taking action. Okay, yep. Haley Higdon says nature time. Thank you, Haley, yep. Chang says, I'm constantly encouraging my friends to eat less meat and to go vegan, yep. Anything else you're doing? 
Oh, uh, Miko says attending events like this one. Thank you. Uh, Miko's another member of our wonderful uh, sustainability and climate action team, and she's been doing taking lots of action herself, actually, in the work that she's been doing with us. Um, going to therapy, voting with your wallet, great idea, looking to possible solutions, um, developing a, a, a better understanding of carbon footprint awareness, and we can measure that, we know. Um, attending events, uh, thinking with like-minded people, all of these are fantastic strategies. And in fact, um, another recent study has said that developing those relationships, so building those networks with other people who are some of similarly feeling anxious, uh, is it's a great way to deal with our mental health generally, for sure. Um, but uh, very, very helpful when it comes to talking about climate anxiety. Um, thanks to Haley for mentioning that connecting with nature is a really great way to deal with it. In fact, doctors are starting to prescribe, like literally write prescriptions for time spent in nature, which is interesting. And in fact, um, the Canada Parks Service has, uh, was it Canada Parks or BC? One of the park services in Canada has just started to accept those prescriptions for free entries into their park services. I think it was in BC, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, which is really kind of interesting. I know that for myself personally, this is one of my great coping strategies is to spend time in nature. Um, that really helps me uh, deal with my, my climate anxiety. And then as many of you have put into the chat is dealing, um, finding ways to take climate action. And these are some of the strategies that we can do with youth, uh, children and youth that we work with if you're an educator in classrooms, which is so incredibly important. Uh, there's a reference to the, uh, the study and it's on the resource list for you to, uh, to access if you'd like moving forward. Now, I would like to play just a very short video from Catherine Hayhoe. Catherine is not only a graduate from the Toronto District School Board, so here in Toronto, but she's also a U of T alumni as well. And she's now one of the leading environmental and climate scientists and voices in the States for taking climate action. She um, has a fabulous podcast you can listen to. She's got a great TED talk as well. And she talks about uh, one of the ways that we can start to address our climate anxiety. So let's take a listen together. I think one of the biggest questions we all have when it comes to climate change is, is there hope? People often ask me, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. How can I make a difference? But if there is one thing that I wish everybody would do, it's talk about it. I'm suggesting that we talk about why it matters. What do I care about passionately that is being affected by a changing climate? Does it relate to my kids? Does it relate to something I love doing like birding or fishing or even hunting? Does it relate to the economy or national security or the community or the place where I live? Let's talk about what it means to us and then let's also talk about solutions because there are amazing solutions. When it comes to climate change, we feel as if it is this giant boulder standing dead still and nobody's trying to push that boulder uphill to fix the problem. The reality is that giant boulder is already starting to roll. It's got hundreds, thousands, even millions of payments. We just need a few more hands to get it rolling faster, but it is moving in the right direction. But when we look at what's happening with people, that's where I find hope. So Catherine has some great words of advice for all of us, um, and that is to start to talk about it. And that seems like such a simple thing, but we really haven't been doing that in a big enough way to start to really impact change. And that's a very simple action. I, I loved, I was reading during the video, all of the actions that you posted into the chat. Thank you so much. We're gonna unpack these a little bit more moving forward. But one of the things we can do is we can start certainly with just in working with our, our spheres of influence. Um, we have to do this from a hopeful position. And in fact, David Orr, who has been in the past, a uh, very influential environmental and sustainability educator and faculty member, um, researcher, um, has one of my favorite quotes, honestly, of all time. And that is, hope is not just a, you know, something that we, we invent to make ourselves feel better, but hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. That what we need to do is start to enact, to, uh, to really take the things that we feel hopeful about and work towards them in very concrete ways. And by doing that, uh, and especially with our students, uh, we can really start to um, take action that will help to alleviate their climate anxiety. Now we can do that on different scales. As Catherine suggests, um, and she talks about this in her TED talk actually really clearly, is that we have different spheres of influence. Um, 
as individuals. We can certainly start with our own actions. Modeling the change that we want to see is always a great starting point, so we don't get accused of being hypocrites. Um, but we can also start working with the people that we know and we love, because the reality that the climate crisis is threatening those um, people that we love. So starting with our family and friends and talking about our deep concerns um, and, and what actions we could take together is a great starting point. But we can also work with our communities. Now we might not work with our whole community simultaneously. Uh, what we do wanna bring about is wide scale system change. There's no doubt about that. But most of us aren't tapped into every aspect of our community, but we do have spheres of influence within certain aspects of our community. Um, Catherine in her head talk talks a little bit about her faith communities and how she's really started to work with her church group, um, in fact, uh, because that's one that she's deeply connected to. No big surprise at Boise, uh, I'm deeply connected to education, uh, and so many of us are, and that's a really great place to start this work, is using education as a site for, um, uh, for, for collective action. So we are gonna start with the personal, let's start with the self, that's always an easy place to start because we control our actions. And I'm interested what personal climate actions you're taking. You cited a few of them in the chat. Um, can, you, can you pop a few more in? What are you doing personally? I did read earlier, and you're welcome just to scroll back through some of the ones that people had popped in um, earlier. Uh, writing letters and supporting eco-action organizations from Sandra McEwen, who is an, an accomplished environmental educator herself. Um, Chang talked about using uh, having um, conversations uh, Patricia talks about uh, supporting orgs like uh, Eco Justice, which is a fantastic NGO here in Canada. Um, and, uh, and Michael talks about being really thoughtful about uh, how, you, how you're gonna vote in, in elections, right? Um, Cam talks about um, listening to Dr. Diane Sachs. Um, uh, and Cam, you're absolutely right. Uh, fantastic voice, our former environmental commissioner for the province of Ontario. Um, Anissa talks about doing really conscious consumerism. We know what we can't survive on this earth without having an impact, but we can be really careful in thinking about the kinds of impacts we can have and how we can reduce those impacts. So thank you for that. Uh, Linda talks about moving maybe to an electric vehicle. Um, and Alfred uh, talks about uh, being an advocate, ad really being strongly uh, uh, advocating for um, climate action. Um, and Jen says that she's made a tough decision about not having children. Now, Jen, I've got to admit, that's one that my sister often lobs back at me, that my, my action of having two sons uh, well over 25 years ago <laughs> is my biggest fault as an environmental and sustainability educator. And, and she is right in that. But 25 years ago, we weren't really thinking in this, in this light, right? So I know that there's lots of young people who are thinking very carefully uh, about uh, their choice about having children moving forward. Um, Beatrice talks about um, having an awareness about the limitations of recycling. And thank you, Beatrice, for thinking a little bit about that. Because we know that that was pushed really heavily starting in the 70s. Oh, if we all recycle, it'll help save the world. But we have come to the realization that that really isn't true. And in fact, it really doesn't have much of an impact uh, in the grand scheme of things. So let's talk from the David Suzuki Foundation's perspective, what the, some of the most uh, best actions with the most impact that we can have. You know, using sustainable forms of transportation, which a couple of you have mentioned, uh, is really important. And the pandemic has kind of slid us in this direction, maybe not quite in the direction we wanted, but lots more people in the GTA have been biking and walking because they weren't feeling safe on public transit. I, I think we're realizing that in fact, it is pretty safe on public transit uh, as long as you're masked. Um, and so, so we can start to migrate back to using public transit again. Um, but one of the biggest things we can do is to fly less. Now, you know, that's a really hard decision to make. Many of us have families that are really far afield, myself included. So can I say I'm never going to fly again? I know some people are making that choice and I admire them for it. I'm not sure I can do that and still maintain my uh, family connections. Um, but I am greatly reducing the amount of flights and I'm thinking carefully about the amount of flights that I'm taking at this point, um, which is really important. I am absolutely like many of you that you popped into the chat. I am absolutely rethinking my diet. I'm thinking about how I can eat local. I'm really happy to say that um, uh, the University of Toronto Mississauga campus is actually working on a vertical farm. I think it's gonna be the biggest of its kind in Canada when it's done um, so that we can start to grow more and more of what we have been shipping from other parts of the world locally, which is really interesting and figuring out ways to do that with sustainable forms of energy, of course. Um, moving to a plant-based diet, really important as well. And lots of you have set, talked about moving to both vegetarian and veganism. 
which is great. For those of you who are not there yet, uh, it's okay, but reducing your intake of meat is one way to make that shift. Um, you know, I, I, I've had uh, young men who have been very focused on eating meat over the years, and we started quite slowly a number of years ago to start to reduce the amount of red meat in particular, but also the amount of meat overall. And I'm actually really pleased that both of them are, are eating a, an omnivore's diet now, but one with a, a, a much bigger emphasis on plant-based diet than they've had in the past. So not perfect yet, but getting there. And if we all started to make those shifts, that would help help a lot, which would be great. Um, and certainly we know that food waste is one of the biggest problems in dealing with food insecurity. It's not that we're not producing enough food in the world, we are, but we're wasting, some figures are saying 25 to 30% of it on a global basis, which is ridiculous <laughs> considering the energy that goes into not only raising that food, but also shipping it to where it's gonna be consumed. So reducing our food waste is something that we can do individually as well. We can certainly work at conserving energy at home. There's no doubt that working towards uh, weaning ourselves off of both oil-based fuel sources as well as uh, natural gas is uh, the ideal. Um, but we can turn to you know, choose to turn down the thermometer in our homes, our, our thermostats a couple of degrees, and we can choose not to air condition as much as we have been in the past either. I'm always shocked about how many businesses will leave their doors wide open in the summer when they're air conditioning. I've, I've never understood that. And now I'm at the point where I go in and ask them to close the door or stop that altogether. <laughs> so, um, so learning to conserve energy is important and certainly reducing consumption as well. Um, it used to be the three R's were recycle, reduce, and reuse. And we're changing that. We're now at sort of refuse it in the first place. Just don't buy new stuff if you don't need it. Um, that reusing, I'm buying most of my wardrobe now from vintage shops. And I'm not only impressed with the quality and the beauty of the pieces I can buy, but also how much money it's saving me. So win-win all the way around. Um, and then repairing. So Apple's contributed uh, an important step towards the repair economy. Moving forward, they've said that we can now buy parts and we can crack open our phones to replace a screen or a battery, whatever it happens to be ourselves. So those kinds of moves are gonna be important for us to pick up on so we can actually re really reduce our consumption. So, so there are lots, and I, I really appreciate, um, thank you, your contributions in the chat to other ideas that you've got from choosing organic uh, produce to banning single occupant vehicles. I mean, there's so many great ideas that we can have uh, out there, which are uh, ways that we can choose, right, personally to make these kinds of choices. But we know that collectively we, we must take action as well. The time has passed where we have to rely on individuals to take action. We really need to combine individual action with collective action at this point in time. And because of that, education must be involved, right? We know that education can be actually very good at leading cultural shifts towards sustainability. We've seen a radical shift, um, for example, in how we think about decolonization and reconciliation, even just over the last five years in this country. And that's come about in part through education, both informally and formally. So we know that it's possible to use education as a way to encourage both attitudinal and behavioral shifts. We also know that growing active and engaged citizens can start really early. And in fact, David Suzuki talks quite openly about how he made a really uh, important tactical error early in his career by choosing to work with adults and aiming the knowledge mobilization that he does with his research at adults. He said, I should have been working with kids right from the get go. He's been at it so long that those children, if he'd started working with them early on, would now be adults and leading action on their own. So we know that this work can start very early in school classrooms. We also know that education has a responsibility to deepen knowledge and a sense of responsibility with our students and youth about climate justice, about better understanding the disproportionate effects of the climate crisis on those who are racialized, marginalized, and oppressed. And that we, this has got to be part of the conversation moving forward, that we must include working towards climate justice as part of this work. And finally, we need to take an active role uh, as educators in empowering both individual and collective sense of hope. We can't move forward if we're all frozen with fear and anxiety about what's gonna happen with the climate crisis. We need to end, uh, really harness hope as a way for students and, and adults to feel a sense of agency and then take action. And education is a perfect setting to do that in. So we know that we need to learn from Indigenous peoples as part of this, um, this equation. Indigenous peoples in this country, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, 
have been figuring out ways to live sustainability on the land for generations. And they are fantastic teachers for us, if only we will listen. So I wanted to just to share a short video from Indigenous Climate Action. It's a relatively new NGO in this country that is a really centering Indigenous voices as part of this work. So let me just get this going. There are things happening on the land that are very disturbing. Some of our lakes have become unswimmable. Some of our well water has become unswimmable. Elders can't predict a lot of the weather patterns or what is known in our traditional ecological knowledge. It's affecting the maple. It affects the trees. Some of the birds are not even flying south anymore. The medicines that we used to be able to find, we can't find them anymore. But we know that the animals are going to suffer. And if the animals suffer and the land suffers, we're going to suffer. Communities are flipping into the ocean in the Arctic, or their houses are literally sinking into the permafrost. And it feels like the only people that are like being like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? Have been Indigenous communities calling for an end to these things. Transition needs to happen now. We need to stop doing what we've been doing and begin something new. That's where this idea of Indigenous climate action has really come from. This idea that Indigenous peoples aren't just the first to be impacted, but can be the first people to provide solutions that are grounded in more than just economic solutions. Canada and its whole system, its whole economic paradigm is fundamentally out of sync with what real tangible action on climate looks like. What I see from grassroots movements like ICA, I don't know more, they're putting together plans that are ambitious and something that actually reflects the type of knowledges that we're talking about all the time when we talk about indigenous knowledge. We are our own experts. We don't have to translate ourselves all the time through the lens of the mainstream. We want to work towards a recognition of our fundamental role as, uh, as the leaders in this discussion. Because we can't just be addressing climate from a science perspective. We have to be addressing it from a human rights perspective and an Indigenous rights perspective. Indigenous climate actions and other Indigenous-led initiatives and mobilizations are going to be critical to making that happen in the most effective way. <laughs> So we know that uh, we have important listening to do to Indigenous people. And I do want to give a shout out because I see that Haley Higdon is in the room, who's uh, the project lead on a great project here at UT called Natural Curiosity. It uh, brings a, a environmental inquiry and better instruction environmental inquiry to do with children and youth, but does so through an Indigenous lens. So Haley, I'm going to invite you to, oh, and there she's already got it in the chat. Um, I did include Natural Curiosity on the resource list. And I can absolutely recommend the amazing work that they do in this area. And it's part of um, the OISE community, uh, the work that has been designed. We know that the conversation around um, accessing Indigenous knowledge, understanding, um, and perspectives is important, even in how the UN is um, framing the sustainable development goals. Now, one could argue that they should have had Indigenous perspectives built right into the 17 goals. But there are lots of conversations these days that are truly to be sustainable in this world. Not only do we need to be thinking about the intersectionality of poverty, of homelessness, of um, a gender inequality, but we need to weave all of these things together with climate action, that climate justice must be, think, be, be seen holistically. Certainly um, at OISE, we've been uh, very strong, I think, in terms of uh, working towards social justice education, and quality education, that's SDG4 in particular, but uh, also we've been really trying to work with our sustainability and climate action network and, and previously to that, the environmental and sustainability ed initiative uh, to the climate action piece and the sustainable cities and communities piece, which is a SDG 11 and SDG 13. So there's no doubt that we can do a whole lot more work in this area. And I think you're gonna see U of T as a whole focusing more and more clearly on the SDGs to help guide our actions in terms of what sustainability looks like. Now, there's no doubt that uh, Ontario uh, has been one of the provincial leaders when it comes to education, uh, helping to 
change uh, the systems in which we live towards sustainability. Um, but I would say they haven't been as active as they could have been. Back in 2009, they launched something called Acting Today, Shaping Tomorrow, which was a policy framework that advocated for environmental education, that's the term they used, EE, um, in every single grade, starting in kindergarten, going up through grade 12, and in every single subject area. Fantastic. And since then, we really haven't heard anything from the Ministry of Education about it. So we need to have a whole lot more action on the part of the OME to support the enactment of this policy framework. And I think at this point, honestly, it probably needs a refresh uh, too. So I invite the ministry to, uh, to really step up its game when it comes to um, focusing on um, climate action and using education as a site for that. We started work when we heard that this policy was coming down the pipe, uh, along with my colleagues, um, Jane Forbes, who's now retired from Boise, and David Montemurro, who is still very much active. Uh, we helped to form the Environmental and Sustainability Ed Initiative in 2008. And we started by working in a focused way in our teacher education programs, which are, are some of the largest in the country, knowing that we wanted to make an impact with teachers at the very early starts of their career. We did that through providing course support to different faculty members by infusing workshops into existing courses and developing new courses outright. And in fact, we're one of the few programs in the, the faculties of ed programs in the entire country that has core and mandatory courses in our teacher ed program focused on environmental and sustainability ed. We've had many conferences and eco fairs, and I'm going to give a shout out to Elise, who has uh, been our administrative lead on the last, I think, four or five years worth of conferences. She does a fabulous job every year on that. Uh, we, we organize about 20 talks and workshops every year on this topic. Uh, we have a student club. We've got a co-curricular designation where students get, can get certified um, as part of their co-curricular learning environmental and sustainability ed, uh, an active digital communications hub with uh, a website um, and, uh, and lots of resources there. And we've really been active in trying to encourage and develop more research projects, uh, sharing that through publications and conference presentations as well. So, so we have been at this work for now getting close to, uh, to 14 years. But we have been inspired by our communities in doing that. So we like to think that we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're just taking really great ideas that are already happening in our communities and bringing those into the educational context. So this is Noel Harding's work. Some of you may think this looks a little familiar. And if you live in the Toronto area and have driven or cycled down the Dawn Valley, uh, then you've probably seen these and in the past. This is Noel Harding's art installation called Elevated Wetlands. Noel was one of the first artists to start to realize that there's a potential for art making uh, right in the city of Toronto to actually address some of our sustainability issues and, and to take action on it. So these giant uh, sculptures, which look a little bit like giant molars, like in your teeth, or, or some people have said they look a lot like elephants without heads, um, in fact, help to fit or filter Don, um, the, the water from the Don River, not all of it, to be fair, it was a really seen as a test site at this point in time, um, to, to really think about how we can bring art and science together uh, to create these really interesting sustainability solutions, in this case, filtering the polluted water from the Don River. Um, if you want to see the newest iteration of this, visit Sherborne Commons this summer where Jill Anholt's installation, in fact, filters larger amounts of Dawn River water uh, in a really fascinating and, and really beautiful aesthetic way. Um, and that's right down at the uh, Queen's Key. We took inspiration from that at OISE and we've been developing, and not on the same scale to be fair, but we have been using uh, visual arts and visual arts education, which is one of my areas of expertise, as a way to not only raise awareness around environmental and sustainability issues, but also to encourage um, uh, changes in, uh, in behavior. Um, Elise and I led a research study that we published on um, about how these community created installations in OISE's main stairwell, you can walk them now as the building reopens. In the main stairwell, there's about 14 of them all together. And um, we have been able to demonstrate that not only does it um, deepen our students' awareness when they're involved in creating these collective art installations, but that actually helps to shift their, um, their behaviors towards a greater form of sustainability as well, which is really exciting to see. We've also been inspired by the work of some of our partners. So we know that the TDSB's Eco Schools program has been one of the leading programs in the country. And in fact, at one point was the only Eco Schools program in the country. Um, it's now spun off to a national program, the Eco Schools uh, Canada, which is fantastic. So schools across the country can now engage in Eco Schools programming. But this is one of the projects that they worked on with FoodShare, taking empty, in this case, 
empty tennis courts on top of Eastdale Collegiate, which is in the heart of the city. It's a Gerard Broadview area and creating a market garden that was created by the students in the school. They helped to plan it, they helped to plant it, and they've ha helped to actually collect for the last few years uh, produce off the roof. And that's done as youth employment grants or youth employment grants, so it helps to employ youth in the school community. It's cross-curricular learning really, I think at its finest, and helps to deal and uh, address notions of food insecurity and food injustice. Um, in, in these communities in downtown Toronto. So really a fabulous project. And we've taken inspiration, again, in small ways. You don't always have to replicate at scale, right? Um, with our uh, community learning garden at OISE, which has um, really helped to raise awareness, not only about the importance of biodiversity in the city by planting native plant species, but also about the power of educational gardening, which has now spread to all sorts of TDSB schools, which is really exciting to see. So we're part of introducing that to teachers very early on in their teacher education programs to understand about the, the importance of educational gardening as a learning tool. We've taken inspiration in all sorts of ways from the TDSB and um, whether it is, uh, you know, uh, FDK um, garden spaces, sometimes on rooftops and sometimes on playgrounds for young children and kindergarten to be involved in, whether it's waste audits in the lower left, whether it's uh, helping to lead professional learning for teachers. Um, the TDSB has just had, as part of the pandemic, they found funding to install hundreds of uh, the, these water bottle filling stations in their schools. And they were doing that while the schools were empty. So they really jumped on that opportunity. One of the best opportunities they've done though is to install solar panels now in over 330 schools. And that's generating income, which they're turning back into more sustainability initiatives. So that's really exciting work. And that's helped to fuel a, a partnership that began in 2017, bringing OISE students together with TDSB teachers. And I see so many of your names in the room today that have been active participants in this to help model for um, students, again, early in their teaching careers, what um, environmental sustainability ed can look like. And we've done that in so many different ways, including AQ courses and uh, our amazing action research team that's filled with teacher researchers from the TDSB. Um, and great partnerships with NGOs as part of this as well. That partnership gave us the idea for this. And so we've been able to uh, now over the last few years, not only um, uh, community source the idea for a sustainability and climate action plan for OISE, uh, but we are working hard already. We're just at the end of our first year of this plan of ensuring that sustainability and climate action over time become really integral components of our work. Um, and our commitment to a more equitable and sustainable world. There's five different strands to the plan that take it farther than what we were doing with the Environmental and Sustainability Initiative. And again, we've been very inspired by the work that the TDSB has done. We uh, absolutely uh, listen carefully to all of their good ideas about how to bring about systemic change in this area. And we're bringing those ideas that they've already started in a K-12 school board, and we brought that into a higher ed context at the University of Toronto. Three-year plan, 24 actions, 62 strategies. We have a, a large uh, amount of work still, still to do ahead of us, but we've been working very actively on this, even in our first year, starting with the summit that helped to, uh, to crowdsource the ideas for the plan, in fact, bringing well over 100 um, OISE community members together to uh, help inform the research and development of that plan. Um, uh, we've been really lucky in having um, some very supportive deans in the past, who have helped to um, establish a climate action advisory committee, a sustainability fund, um, who helped uh, us become the first group at UT to have a climate emergency declaration as a faculty uh, uh, collectively. Um, having a national conference uh, in this work um, that Haley Higdon and I co-chaired along with um, Lindsay Bunce from EcoSchools Canada last spring. Um, we've been working really hard on trying to embed this into the fabric of what we do uh, at OISE. We've also just started a community practice on sustainability teaching uh, that's just launched actually a couple of weeks ago. And it's the start of a more collaborative piece that we're gonna be working on in taking this work across the university, which is really exciting. We've been inspired in this by um, John Robinson's concept of regenerative sustainability. Um, now, John was a faculty member, longstanding faculty member and um, sustainability champion at UBC and in fact, was really instrumental in UBC establishing a lot, large part of its identity as a university 
around the shift to sustainability. Um, he's retired from UBC, but we are very lucky now to have him at U of T. His retirement project is helping U of T make that same shift. And in fact, he's now the presidential advisor at U of T on environment, uh, climate change and sustainability. Um, he's one of many uh, scholars around the world that have been developing this concept of regenerative sustainability. And it's a, it's a great idea. It's this idea that we shouldn't just be aiming for net zero. Who wants to aim for zero? Um, in fact, what we want to do is aim for net positive, that our impacts as humans on the world could actually leave the world in a slightly better place than we find it. So this is a great example of the Center for Interactive Research and Sustainability. I'm going to give you just one tiny example of this, that in fact, the rainwater that's collected on the roof um, not only uh, fuels a lot of the water functions in this building, including flushing the toilets, because it's gray water, but it's filtered and clean before it goes back into the sewer system. So the water that actually goes back into the sewers um, at, from this building is cleaner than when it arrived as rainwater through um, those, those top collection mechanisms on the roof. So that's just one example. And I'm really interested in how we can use education as a way to move towards regenerative sustainability. Um, and, and that's part of the discussion that's happening now at U of T with our climate positive uh, campus plan, which uh, has just been launched a little while ago but it's gonna put sustainability education and research really at the heart of one of the three key uh, sort of key principles that's gonna fuel U of T moving forward. We're starting already with a huge geothermal energy installation. It's happening right in the heart of the St. George campus. We're gonna have a solar farm that's gonna offset of the energy use uh, on the rest of campus and all sorts of building retrofits. And I'm hoping that Boise will become one of those that gets a building retrofit moving forward. Certainly we are starting to work in small ways towards that with the reopening of our fifth floor patio that's gonna have an educational garden as well as other sustainability features on it as well. So really exciting developments that are now happening across the university and we're really happy at Boise to be uh, one of the leaders in that work. I will just give a little shout out to the Adam Sustainability Celebration. It's happening right now. Um, uh, it, the link will be uh, in the chat. Thank you, Elise, uh, for you as well as um, uh, on the resource uh, handout for you as well. And they're giving away all sorts of money to start to really signal that this is important work for the university, which is great. And the event series is already underway. So I encourage you to take, play, take part of that. Anybody can, you don't have to be a member of the university to do that. And you know, all of this work, is it ever gonna be for naught? I don't think so. This is Joel Pett's great cartoon from 2009. What if it's a big hoax? He's talking about the climate crisis and we create a better world for nothing. Well, we know it's not for nothing. We know that we have complex and wicked problems in the world that we can address as we move forward with climate action. If you uh, aren't inspired by Joel's co uh, comments on that, please be inspired by Amanda Gorman's work. I'm gonna leave you today with um, one final video from Amanda Gorman, who is the Youth Poet Laureate of the United States. She's the one who spoke at uh, Biden's inauguration. And she's got a wonderful poem called Earthrise. And if you haven't been inspired by anything else today, maybe this one will inspire you. On Christmas Eve, 1968, astronaut Bill Anders snapped a photo of the Earth as Apollo 8 orbited the moon. Those three guys were surprised to see from their eyes a planet looked like an Earth rise, a blue orb hovering over the moon's gray horizon with deep oceans and silver skies. It was a world's first glance at itself, a first chance to see a shared reality, a declared stance and a commonality, a glimpse into a planet's mirror. And as threats drew nearer, our own urgency, became clearer as we realized that we hold nothing dearer than this floating body we all call home. We've known that we're caught in the throes of climactic changes. Some say will just go away while some simply pray to survive another day. For it is the obscure, the oppressed, the poor, who when the disaster is declared done, still suffer more than anyone. Climate change is the single greatest challenge of our time. Of this, you're certainly aware. It's saddening, but I cannot spare you from knowing an inconvenient fact because it's getting the facts straight that gets us to act and not to wait. 
So I tell you this not to scare you, but to prepare you, to dare you to dream a different reality where despite disparities, we all care to protect this world, this riddled blue marvel, this little true marvel to master the verve and the nerve to see how we can serve our planets. You don't need to be a politician to make it your mission to conserve, to protect, to preserve that one and only home that is ours to use your unique power to give next generations the planet they deserve. We are demonstrating, creating, advocating, we heed this inconvenient truth because we need to be anything but lenient with the future of our youth. And while this is a training and sustaining the future of our planet, there is no rehearsal. The time is now now, now, because the reversal of harm and protection of a future so universal should be anything but controversial. So, Earth, pale blue dots, we will fail you not, just as we chose to go to the moon. We know it's never too soon to choose hope. We choose to do more than cope with climate change. We choose to end it. We refuse to lose. We do this and more, not because it's very easy or nice, but because it is necessary. Because with every dawn, we carry the weight of the fate of this celestial body orbiting a star. And as heavy as the weight sounded, it doesn't hold us down, but it keeps us grounded, steady, ready, because an environmental movement of this size is simply another form of an earth lies. To see it, close your eyes, visualize that all of us in this room and outside of these walls or in these halls, all of us change makers are in a spacecraft floating like a silver raft in space and we see the face of a planet anew. We relish the view, we witness its round green and brilliant blue, which inspires us to ask deeply, wholly, what can we do? Open your eyes, know the future of this wise planet is right in sight, right in all of us. Trust this earth of rising, all of us bring light to exciting solutions never tried before, for it is our hope that implores us at our uncompromising core to keep rising up for an earth more than worth fighting for. Is that not a magnificent poem? Like really, uh, this young lady is just uh, an incredible poet at such an early age. I don't know where she gets the wisdom from, um, but she knows and she uses what she's good at. She uses her sphere, oh, sorry, her sphere of influence, right? Um, uh, as, a, as not only a young person, as a young black person, as a young black poet to, to help change the world. So now I'm interested, what new commitment can you make based on today's talk? I know many of you are very active in this work, in this work. I've, I've seen evidence of that in the chat today, so thank you so much for all of your contributions. Um, but what new commitment can you make moving forward? Could it be to share Amanda's poem with your classes uh, tomorrow to start the day? Uh, could it be to bring the arts uh, more generally into um, connecting the head, the heart, and the hands to, to have learning that really sticks with our students? Um, is it about taking your students outside? So pop that into the chat or on your piece of paper that you'd be making notes with. Um, what's your commitment after today's workshop moving forward? So Jen says to network more. Jen, come join our network at OISE. We would love to, uh, to have your, uh, your ideas involved in that. Um, uh, sharing videos from Alicia and resources with both students and teachers alike. Absolutely. Um, think about how you can continue your learning. We are gonna send out a, a list of resources uh, listening to these videos again is one step. They are, they are on that list of resources, um, certainly is one way to, uh, to go. Uh, connecting with others. So Jen, your ideas about connecting and working with others is really important. Use those spheres of influence, right? To help bring about individual and collective action. Um, I think Catherine's Hayho, Catherine Hayhoe's hopefulness about working together to help push that boulder is um, such so much more palatable when we think of doing it together. So we encourage you to to join us, please, for, uh, for more work um, in, in this area and uh, to continue to strengthen the work on sustainability and climate action at OISE and beyond. If you want to connect with us, uh, we are just in the process of moving our socials over to our new handle of SCAN. 
So uh, as long as you're uh, on the website, you can join our listserv and get announcements each week about what's coming up. Uh, you can find that in the contact area on the website. So I just want to thank everybody for your involvement today. I loved all of the ideas that you popped into the chat. And a huge thanks to the OISE Alumni Association, to Sim and to Natalie, and Elise for helping to organize, and to Asta for being part of that as well. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for attending today. Thank you, Hillary. I think that was amazing. Um, you know, there were so many smart little nuggets there that we're, I'm sure we're all going to take away. Um, I think what stood out for me, obviously, with the ending with the beautiful poem was also let's act and let's not wait, right? And each of us have made those commitments, which are still flowing in in the chat. So that's amazing. So appreciate you kind of helping us take action today. And, and we're going to learn from each other and Hopefully there are other versions of this that um, we can continue to offer to the group here. Um, appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we see that everyone's interested and they want to learn and continue to learn. So the OIZ alumni group will continue to offer these um, going forward. Thanks, Sim, so much. And thanks, Natalie, as well. Um, appreciate Elise uh, and, and your support and getting Hillary on board. And um, have a great evening, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. And uh, we'll see you soon.